We had them a big medieval history program there and everything. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Toronto would be would be a good next step. And I, I think that's what I'll consider next. I have to look at the the pricing. Some of the pricings are like ridiculous. Like you have to pay for them to oh, yeah. do it. Um, and I don't I don't think I'm gonna go that route. I don't think well they require a subvention overall. I don't know if to review it, but they require, require a subvention. Yeah. yeah so. You know, um Jane Wickersham at uh at University of Oklahoma, who specializes in the Inquisition in Italy, published with them a few years ago. And I think it was part of a medieval history series at Toronto. So mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know who their editor was for that series in particular, but and yeah, look up Stephen Shapiro. He's he's great to work with. I don't know if he'd be the medievalist, but he helped us from the modernist angle. Yeah. Jason, do you know do you know Jane? I took a class with her. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I went to India University with her. She used to babysit our son Max. So yeah, she's great. <laughs> she she so, did. We we had a big Galileo class, and uh, she she of course was the sort of Inquisition yeah. expert. While we were there. Well, you took a class from her, so thanks for making me feel old, there, Nathan. I'll go kill myself now. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, Abby Gotro, one of our, you know, Abby, um, she took classes from another colleague of mine at, um, what was her undergrad? I forgot what it was. Um, Randolph Macon's University, I think it was. But um, anyhow, made me feel old. So, you know. <laughs> was it a good class, Nathan? Did you enjoy it? As much as I hate talking about Galileo, it was a fantastic class. Yeah, yeah. She specialized in, you know, Kind of intersections of health and medicine and you know social and political history and everything so it's just great yeah, yeah why no, she, would you was, hate talking about galileo because that's all people talk about in the history of science i, I, I yeah. just we we got we got it sort of like shoved in our face and i was just tired oh okay Gal- galileo is interesting for sure yeah it was just an overdose like having being being required to take an entire graduate seminar at galileo sort of sort of d- did galileo for me and then <laughs> Well, it's 3.02, and uh, we got a healthy number of people here, and I think uh, more people are coming in, but uh, we'll get things started. Um, So allow me to uh, formally introduce our speaker today. This is Dr. Peter Dobik. He is a visiting assistant professor here at Grand Valley State University for the History Department. We are very happy to have him as part of our faculty. And uh, he just got his PhD, just received his PhD not too long ago in 2019 from Western Michigan University. Uh, So he's a young faculty member. And I think if you've heard some of the the chatting uh, right here uh, before our talk, a lot of it had to do with uh, what what, uh, professional historians do is they do their research and then send uh, various things that they want to get published, whether it be an article or a book, off to presses uh, to be published. But of course, those things have to be evaluated by our peers. And that's always a a difficult process to endure. And so that's one thing that that Professor Dobik is enduring right now as he's trying to get some of his research that I'm sure he just completed with respect to his dissertation, some of it published out for all us to to read and enjoy. So it's really exciting for us to uh, be able to host one of our young faculty members uh, to be presenting, uh, which essentially by definition is cutting edge research uh, coming out of uh, his, his, his graduate program at Western Michigan University. Uh, he earned his uh, PhD in, in, in medieval history, uh, in European history. And of course uh, he, he teaches uh, courses in world history and European history for us here at, at Grand Valley. So without further ado, I am going to uh, formally hand it over to Professor Dobik as he presents. I'm going to mess up, I think, the dynasty name. <laughs> but I don't love his title. It's don't like, worry, the, the person announcing my my my, dissert, my dissertation during the graduation ceremony butchered it too. So, <laughs> and that was in I'm front of like that. thousands of people. So you're fine. The, but a great title. <laughs> Visiting taverns in excess. Hope that doesn't scribe anyone in the room here. <laughs> the University of Krakow and the public houses during the Jagiellonian dynasty. Did I, I messed it up, didn't I? What is it? What is Jagiellonian it? Jagiellonian dynasty. Jagiellonian. Close. All right. I, too much with the J. Yeah, that's, yeah, you're right. Yeah. That's it's close. Good job. Hota, Hota, I guess, in, uh, in yeah. Spanish. All right. That makes sense. Thank, okay, I'll let you uh, take it over there, uh, Professor Dobek. Thank you for joining us. And yeah, we're really excited about this. Uh, about this presentation. Okay, let me just share my screen here first with everyone.
All right. So thank you, Professor Huner, for that great introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And of course, thank you to the department for inviting me to do this. Um, as Professor Huner mentioned, I, this is part of my dissertation work, and this is um, part of what I will be presenting in, um, in a couple of weeks at the Medieval Congress. And so this is kind of the, the first start to that project. And this is looking at, in particular, the relationship between the University of Krakow, which at, was, it was named that at the time, but has since been renamed as the Jagiellonian University. Um, and so it's looking at the time period during the dynasty that ruled at that time. And so on May 12th, 1364, Casimir III, who is known as the Great, established the Studium Generale in the city of Krakow. In the year prior, he had sent delegates to the papacy in Avignon to lodge a royal supplication for the establishment of a university in the city because many of the kingdom's noble clerks had been captured when making their way to study at other universities, and some had even been reported to have died while held in captivity. Not only was this the beginning of the university, but this was also the beginning of a complex relationship between the students and faculty of the university and the public houses, that is the inns, taverns, and alehouses of the city. Students and faculty began frequenting the public houses as soon as the university started to function. The locales offered the students and faculty a place where they could vent frustrations, participate in debates, gossip, enjoy the local provisions, and much more. Now, I must stress that when students and faculty did visit the public houses, because they were technically forbidden to do so, that is usually what they would experience at one of these places. Not all students and faculty, however, could visit the public houses without causing problems, including falling into debt, engaging in violent acts, gambling, patronizing prostitutes, amongst other nefarious activities. The most prevalent problem caused by the members of the university in the public houses was their debts for various amenities such as drink, food, lodging, and many others. The foundation charter of the university protected the interests of students by exempting them from taxes and customs charges, establishing lodgings, ensuring reasonably priced services, and much more. This helped attract students from within the kingdom, the Polish kingdom, and beyond, including pupils from the Italian lands, the German lands, the Teutonic lands, and the kingdom of Bohemia. The founding document also created a separate jurisdiction for the university in civil and lesser criminal offenses and the right to issue its own statutes. The compilation of the court records formed the Acta Rectoralia, and that is one of the major sources of my dissertation and my work. In the earliest days of the university, there were no, no formal buildings for the university and lectures and classes occurred in parish schools, private homes, churches, the cathedral school, and in academic taverns. As the population of the university grew, so did the demand for accommodations, services, sustenance, and entertainment. The public houses of Krakow, especially those located in the university's vicinity, were happy to provide for the populace. The university's students and faculty, how the university's student and fac faculty housing predominantly surrounded the didactic buildings. These were also locations of various public houses as publicans wanted to take advantage of the clientele base. Students usually lived in burses or dormitories, which contained residential quarters, a kitchen, a library, and sometimes lecture rooms as well. Students usually did not live beyond these edifices because it required special permission from the rector to do so. On a few occasions, however, students secretly lived in the public houses of the city to avoid residing in the dormitories. The university also often provided rooms for the professors in the colleges, and all professors could enter the priesthood, but certainly not all did. The university expected its members to dedicate themselves fully to education and to shun distractions such as public houses, prostitutes, gambling, and alcohol while living in university housing. And so on this map, if you look to the, the, um, the left side right here, 
This area is where the university started and continues to be in this area. Um, so this is the western part of the old town of Krakum. Students and faculty, although expected to leave a, lead a life akin to the monastics, as they have done before and ever since, turned to the public houses where they could vent, vent frustrations, debate academic material, indulge in local provisions, and do much more. Many students between 1433 and 1510, as many as 44%, were also traveling from outside the Polish lands and sought additional accommodations. The population of domestic and foreign students and faculty created an environment where, where cultures, customs, and languages mixed freely in Krakow. This, however, also could create tensions, which would flare up throughout the city on occasion in the public houses. As a result, the university officials attempted to discourage and prevent the students and faculty from frequenting the public houses, but this proved to be futile. Stanisław of Skarbimierz, a doctor of canon law and strong opponent of public houses, became the first rector of the reestablished university in 1400. The rector of the university served various functions. It was his duty to defend the university's rights and privileges, and he publicly announced and explains its statutes. He supervised the conducting of classes and could stop the pay of tutors who were negligent in carrying out their duties. He proved effective in this position and his involvement in the organizational activities and creation of statutes for the university helped reestablish the institution. Stanisław of Skarbimierz was one of the most vocal university authorities and wrote sermons to help his students in a world which he considered to be full of temptations. In his capacity as rector, he often dealt with issues of academic morality and discipline. Students were forbidden from visiting public houses and Stanisław addressed the issue on multiple occasions. For example, in one of his writings, he lamented the fact that students were spending more time in public houses than at their studies. He wrote, quote, few or almost none live with doctors or masters, but commonly in inns where they brawl with women, publicans or their guests, with which the rector and the masters are quite troubled. Stanisław was not only concerned with the students' mental and spiritual well-being, because they were not spending sufficient time with their superiors, but also their physical health because they were fraternizing and brawling with characters, in Stanisław's mind, of ill repute. On various occasions, he criticized these characters, especially women, for their so-called reprehensible behavior. Stanisław Oskarbimierz was not alone in his admonitions of public houses and various other university officials followed in his footsteps. Rector Maciej of Wabeszyna in, his, in a work from 1491 warned students against fallen women, visiting taverns, the agitation of Jews, playing bones and various other aspects. Rector Mikołaj Tempelfeld of Dreg stated, moreover, there are those who at night run through the neighborhoods and the streets and taverns, the dwellings of prostitutes for public spectacle for pomp and guilt. An unknown rector stated, therefore be vigilant, dear students, not in taverns and in alehouses, but be vi vigilant in scripture and in the sexternes. That was a, um, a religious text. Francis of Bregg explicitly instructed that no one should visit the tavern. There was a clear preoccupation among university officials with students, uh, with, with students and faculty frequenting public houses, engaging in nefarious activities and neglecting their studies. Despite the best efforts of Stanisław of Skarbimierz and many other university officials to keep students and faculty of the University of Krakow away from the temptations of public houses and the problems associated with them, they frequented locales throughout Krakow. Numerous court cases refer to the frequency in which these individuals visited the establishments. For example, Matthew of Piotrków was visiting taverns in excess. 
while in 1537, the venerable master Paul Rachas was cited because he frequently entered taverns, which he confessed to. Master Nicholas Herberst needed to cease entering taverns, which he previously was frequently visiting, especially that of Lady Vesikova on St. Stephen's Street. The rector imposed a fine of 10 florins on Matthew, two grosha, which are pennies basically, on Paul, and three marks on Nicholas. The rector later penalized Paul two grosha for negligent, the negligence of two lectures. The rector had also punished Nicholas for neglecting his teaching obligations on four occasions, both prior to and after the aforementioned court case. On Wednesday, November 15th, 1537, the rector likewise charged Master Simon of Krakow for Grusha for neglecting two lectures because he was specifically visiting the tavern. It certainly did not help that publicans maintain public houses next to the university buildings. The faculty created various problems for the publicans of the city. The most common dispute between faculty and publicans involved debts. This included arrears for beer, wine, bread, other foods, lodging, among, among many other things. For example, in 1522, the Honorable Lady and Publican Anna Doktorova of Krakow accused Master Jacob of Sherps for his unpaid debt of 16 groschen for wine, a claim which Jacob denied. Jacob had previously accrued other debts throughout the city, including two marks and half a grosh to Master Thomas of Poznan. Master Martin of Olkush, the rector of the university at the time, determined that Jacob would pay the 16 grosh to Anna. Martin acknowledged um, Anna subsequently in 1531 brought litigation against Master Martin of Krakow for his debts of one florin. Martin acknowledged the debt and agreed to pay it off within two weeks. Martin was no stranger to public houses and had intervened with his sword or knife in an altercation in a tavern in the previous year. Students also fre frequently fell into debt for their consumption in the public houses of the city. They often obtained drink, victuals, lodging, etc., on credit and did not satisfy these debts. For instance, in 1480, on Tuesday, May 16, John Morsky, a student was summoned at the request of a certain layman, John a Taverner on Vistula Street in the city of Krakow. He recognized that he accepted bread and beer from John for half a mark and two groschen. The Lord Rector decreed that he, John Morsky, would be hard pressed for the payment to the layman to resolve effectively the aforementioned sum, henceforth until the next feast of St. Vitus at which time he ought to, place, to replace half, the half mark with two grosha in the presence of the Lord Rector to the man from whom he stole under penalty of excommunication. John Morsky was unable to satisfy the obligation at the designated time, but was fortunate enough to receive a delay of payment from the rector with the publican's consent. Wealthier students could easily resolve such disputes while those of less fortunate those that were less fortunate often struggled to repay the amounts. The rector, with the agreement of the publican, tried to alleviate the burden of the debt by arranging the repayment in several installments. Failure to repay the delinquency often led to a protracted series of litigation and potentially the confiscation of property. The debt of, of a student or faculty member could also escalate into greater problems. The unpaid amount caused hardship for the publicans, and this could cause infamy or an affront to one's honor, uh, because medieval society was quite concerned with one's honor. For example, in 1486, Rector John Baruchowski determined that student John of Le Levin's debt of one Ferton owed to Stanislav Brudnius, a publican of beer on Potter Street and his wife for beer had caused them infamy and therefore John owed six marks in addition to the Ferton. An unpaid debt could easily lead to the infamy of the publicans and the clients. The publicans used the court system to avoid altercations and to publicly transfer their infamy onto the debtor. 
The deaths of students and faculty speak to the large amounts of alcohol occasionally consumed by these clients. The ability for clients to drink on credit made the risk of drinking beyond one's means a real threat. Students and faculty who came from wealthier families could easily satisfy the accruing arrears of overconsumption, while the less fortunate struggled to meet these demands. The amount of alcohol consumed by the clients could also have health concerns. For example, one student was utilizing beer in such abundance that like an astronomer, he often perceived halos in his eyes. As is clear from modern med from medicine today, excessive drinking can cause serious health problems, including blurred vision, liver disease, pancreatitis, cancer, ulcers, osteoporosis, and, health and heart disease. Debt was at times a factor leading to both physical and verbal disputes among the publicans and their clients. The court records and other accounts, however, showed that the occurrence of violence in the public houses of Krakow was an exceptional uh, episode and that on a daily basis, the establishments functioned and provided services for the city without violent incidents. Verbal and physical violence allowed a, an aggrieved party to try to recover a lost honor from debt and the defamation that it caused. For example, on Wednesday, July 6, 1552, the prudent Simon, a publican of wine, suffered an occasion of remarkable infamy caused by Simon Gleevich because Simon, a student, denied that he owed Simon the publican for four barrels of wine. The words spoken by the disagreeing parties and a denial or accusation of debt could cause damage to one's reputation and lead to defamation. And it's an outstanding debt could also easily lead to infamy of one or both parties. In the eyes of Krakowian society, the debtor was dishonorable because he or she did not have the means to satisfy their obligations, while the creditor could look dishonorable because he or she could not collect arrears and therefore not properly manage their public house. Physical violence took multiple forms including hair pulling, slapping, punching, cutting, striking with weapons, raping, and killing. Teeth and hair were often casualties of such episodes, and garments, windows, and furniture were often collateral damage. The appearance of blood meant that affairs were more serious, and the authorities often noted this in the litigation records. The violence usually involved two parties, but could easily escalate to include accomplices, bystanders, or family members. The severity of the violent episodes helped the authorities to determine an appropriate punishment for the incidents. And so here is a, an exceptional um, court case, and I apologize for the, the wall of text, but it's kind of hard to follow, so I wanted to make sure everyone could read it on their own. A remarkable university court case from 1530 exemplifies the use of violence by students and faculty. On Wednesday, November 9th, 1530, the rector of the university heard the case involving an extensive episode of hair pulling. And it goes like this. At the behest of the distinguished Lazarus, Zachary of Kowaki, a student in the school of St. Stephen versus the distinguished Blasius of Bobre, a student continuing in the same place for the incident of hair pulling and of the cruel dragging by the hair in the inn and tavern for which the said Blasius was summoned. In the end, with Blasius receiving an enormous injury in the form of a large and almost lethal wound on his head caused by a spear. The aforementioned Blasius was soul in mind is legitimately contesting the lawsuit that at the time he met with his, com his companion, Peter of Vreshnia, a bachelor student continuing in the same school. Nevertheless, he denied that he had pulled the hair of said Zachary and dragged him by the hair, having inflicted that wound on him, but recalled that Jacob, a brewer, who was then with Blasius and the aforementioned bachelor student, Vreshnia, did it. He, Jacob, a layman, having inflicted a wound on Zachary, soon fled and has not reappeared since. Also, the aforementioned bachelor student with soul in mind legitimately contesting the lawsuit denied that he inflicted the wound on said Zachary, 
although he knew with certainty that the aforementioned Jacob, a layman, struck and wounded Zachary. To which the aforementioned Zachary said in reply that Blasius and the bachelor student cannot be immune from causing the injury since they were with their companion and accomplice, namely said Jacob, the layman who, as they asserted, did it. Zachary continued to question how Blasius and Peter could freely allow their friend to inflict such an enormous injury, especially because Zachary in no way was obnoxious to said Jacob, the layman, and since he never knew him, he had no reason to strike and wound him so extremely. The litigation continued at some length with plaintiff and defendants making additional accusations and defenses. The rector realized that he could not make a final ruling on the matter until he had heard the testimony of Jacob and decided to delay his final judgment. Nevertheless, the Lord Rector decreed a punishment against all three of them, namely Peter, the bachelor student, Zachary and Blasius, according to the statutes of the university for punishments specifically for visiting a tavern, playing games, and causing an injury with weapons for which they will appear in court in two weeks. The rector ordered the group to pay 10 marks and to live in peace until the final resolution of the matter. On Tuesday, December 20th, the rector reaffirmed the lasting peace between Zachary and Blasius. Peter had appeared in previous litigation, but in no lawsuits after this incident. The final outcome of the trial is unknown because it is unclear what happened to Jacob as he does not appear in any other extant court cases. Students and faculty also played various games and gambled in the public houses of Krakow. These activities drew the attention of the authorities and moralizing authors. Numerous legal proceedings showed members of the university frequenting public houses, drinking excessively, playing games, and gambling. One unnamed student, for instance, spent a significant amount of time in public houses and cheated at bones. Bones is like a dice game. It's the precursor to dice. In order to make a profit to spend on alcohol. In another example, the venerable master Matthew of Tredbush spent nearly each day drunk in taverns playing games. Many of the students attending the university, whether local from the Polish lands or from other polities, and faculty enjoyed playing games and gambling at the public houses of the city. This was of course to the dismay of the authorities. The city treated gambling with utmost seriousness and threatened transgressors with fines, imprisonment and banishment from the city. The efforts of the city officials and moralizing authors did not prevent the publicans from banning students and faculty from playing games in the public houses of the city. The students in particular disregarded the warnings of moralizing authors and the legislation of the authorities. For example, in the aforementioned year, so in 1497, on, the, on Thursday, December 14th, Paul, with wisdom, reported that he cited the Honorable Lord Nicholas Svatek from the nation of Mazovia, a bachelor student, uh, according to the office of the Lord Rector, whom the Lord Rector ordered, lest he come to the latest complaint against him, just as he came with more frequency, because he is accustomed to make certain violations, visiting taverns, playing games, inflicting violence on people, and other things, which did not reflect his position, which he did not desist from. The rector also cited Nicholas for living at an inn and not in the dorms with his fellow students and not attending classes. The inhabitants, especially the students, often ignored the legislation of the authorities and regularly visited public houses in order to play various games and to gamble. Various sources suggest that publicans allowed prostitutes to visit and ply their trade in the public houses of Krakow, which also was a temptation for the members of the university. Although the articles governing the Taverners Guild forbade publicans from allowing such, quote, shameful women to linger in one's establishment, 
the court records and the literature of the humanists of Krakow suggest otherwise and show that prostitutes were part of the crowd frequenting public houses. This created an environment that allowed students and faculty to employ those prostitutes. And so here we have another remarkable case. For example, in university litigation from, for, from 1514, Master Stanislav of Kazimierz accused John, a clergyman of the Blessed Virgin and the rector at the school of Corpus Christi of loving Blaskova, a woman of doubtful character. And so in the sources, they won't usually directly say she was a prostitute, but they will insult her character or say of doubtful character. So that's why we know she would be a prostitute. Um, whom he secretly led to a suspicious locale, namely the public house. Various witnesses corroborated, corroborated the allegations and added details to the accusations. One witness suggested that he had heard that John was walking and drinking with Blaskova. A second stated that he had come across the two in the cemetery and John promised to buy him a drink. A third witness said that John promised to give him six groschen for a drink. He was clearly trying to bribe these individuals, these witnesses, so that he wouldn't get in trouble. The students and faculty of the university did not always shun the services of the prostitutes of the, the public houses and clearly employed their services. Despite the best efforts of the rectors, and the university law codes, the students and faculty frequented the public houses of Krakow during the Jagiellonian age. The students and faculty maintained a complicated relationship with the locales, which occasionally could turn problematic. This created situations of debt, infamy, violence, gambling, prostitution, and various other nefarious activities. These occurrences, however, were rare, and the students and faculty normally employed the establishments for their intended purposes, even though they were supposed to avoid the enterprises entirely. Thank you. Any questions? I could, I'll, I'll ask a question, yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Peter, that's a very interesting talk. Um, I wonder what would you identify as your the central argument of your paper, maybe the central argument of your overall work in general, and and why is it important? What is um, does it challenge existing historiography? Does it shift the way we think about medieval life? Um, what's the larger significance of your work? Yeah. Um, so in terms of the paper, it's certainly showing just the complicated nature of the relationship between the university and these important establishments because they are quite important for the functioning of the city. And so in terms of the larger argument of my dissertation, it is also showing how um, the public houses were vital to the life of a city. And in many ways, it does challenge the historiography that's out there. And a lot of that has to do with the fact of the violence. In what we've seen in other works, what I've seen in other works, is that they often claim that these were institutions where violence was regular. Um, we have that Hollywood image, right? For example, where people go to a tavern and a brawl breaks out and all of a sudden, you know, all hell breaks out. And it's not true. Or? It's not true, yeah. So <laughs> at, least, at least not for Krakow. Um, all the court cases I have, I've looked through thousands of court cases and the percentages of violence are minuscule. We're talking about maybe 10% of total court cases involve public houses or publicans or someone at these establishments. And so overall, it's kind of, kind of undermining what we typically think of these places. So I really enjoyed your talk. I thought it was really interesting. Um, two kinds of questions. One, and this kind of piggybacks on what Jason was saying is, What's the history of town gown relations? In other words, is Krakow an exception or is it you know, different? And the other is you've got great images. And I was wondering, are these from illuminated manuscripts or whatever else? Like if, you're, if you've got them in there, how do they fit? Sure, um, definitely. So in terms of the first question, um, 
mine, my work doesn't necessarily look so much at the town and gown violence because that's more with the students and the larger city. And so there's quite a bit of scholarship on that, although there's nothing really, then no one has looked into the violence between the university and Krakow, the city itself. Most medieval scholars look at Western Europe and look at the violence there. So that would certainly be an avenue of future studies, perhaps. Um, my work focuses more on the violence specifically with the public houses and then the city around that, those establishments, right? It's not necessarily examining what the university does. This was just one of the aspects at the different populations of the city and to see how they interact with these establishments. Um, so that was that, and it, that was, that's the answer to that question. In terms of the imagery, um, unfortunately, there is no imagery from Poland. I spent countless hours in archives and speaking to archivists, hoping that they would have some kind of manuscripts and they just don't. Uh, most Polish manuscripts, the nicer ones, were, even, were either stolen during the different wars that passed through the city or they were burned during those wars. And so very few manuscripts, the nice ones still exist. What I was looking at specifically were just court cases. And so these are just, they're notaries, right? They're just clerks in this giant, giant book, just taking very brief notes. Uh, most of the court cases that I showed today are exceptional. Most court cases are a line or two, and it basically tells you who the defendant is, who is the accuser, and what was the crime, and then sometimes you'll get the outcome. And so in most cases, those are very plain. In terms of these images, the map, that was specifically what um, I had put together for my dissertation. The other images are just famous drinking images. Uh, the one where you have someone vomiting, that's a very famous internet meme actually. And that comes from an Italian manuscript. It's an, uh, an Italian manuscript about health. And so that's actually not an image of someone throwing up because they drank too much. It's just someone that happens to be vomiting. The other image comes from that manuscript is about drinking. Um, and in particular, it was a scene of people fighting. And so that's a 14th century Italian manuscript. Some of the others, um, one of them was a German manuscript from the 16th century. So these are all, um, the imagery all basically comes from manuscripts at the time. Hello, Peter. Uh, thank you so much for your interesting talk. Uh, I have a class at four o'clock. Allow me to ask uh, my question, uh, sure. probably uh, before many others. Uh, I have two questions. Number one is a specific question. Uh, you mentioned uh, so many problems uh, in the city of Krakow. I understand all those, uh, slander, insults, uh, prostitution, so many. Uh, one thing I do not understand is a uh, plain bones. I don't know what kind of problem is that. That's number one. Number two, uh, your pres presentation shows that uh, uh, there is a liberal uh, environment in Krakow, which is part of Catholic world uh, in the 13th, uh, in the 14th or 15th century. Uh, this is uh, the beginning of Renaissance. Renaissance emphasizes some uh, liberalism, individualism, I just wonder what kind of relationship it is between Krakow and Renaissance. Two questions, okay. thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in terms of bones, bones is actually, it's a game and it's the precursor to dice. Um, to, today, if we hear someone say, you know, throw the bones, well, that originally came from the middle ages because they literally used to take bones, animal bones and whittle them down and make little um, notches in them to signify the numbers that we now have today. And so Bones was one of the many games that they played. Um, we see that eventually they will get um, card games, they will get chess, things like that. And it's not so much a problem that they're playing the games, it's when they start gambling. The city officials, they have a really complicated relationship with gaming and gambling in the city. And once they start gambling, that's when the city really starts to step in, particularly when it's in excess there's a certain tolerance of just gambling just because you're with your friends, you know, you're putting bets down, things like that. But once it becomes a habitual problem, then the, then the city starts to step in and starts imposing fines or, um, you know, threatening excommunication, things like that. And usually that has to do with the fact that in medieval society, there was this belief that men in particular had to be the head of household 
and had to take care of their household. Well, if they were gambling and wasting money and not devoting their attention to their households, then they were neglecting their duties. And so that's when the, the city felt it needed to step in and to make that, um, to correct that problem. Now, in terms of the Renaissance and the influence on these public houses, we do start to see that become quite a bit of an influence, in particular with the writers. We see that in Krakow, there is actually um, a group that forms. It's called the Bibones and Comendones. And so it's basically the guzzlers and the gobblers. And so this is a literary group. It's basically the, the uh, literati of the city. And they will gather in these public houses. They will drink because they will play up the old, you know, Dionysus and Bacchus influencing, you know, um, their thought. And so that inspires them to to compose poetry, to compose different literary works, but also inspires them to be very, as you put, liberal in that there are stories where some of them will, will strip down completely naked and ride on horses throughout the city. And the city officials frowned upon that and there was a fine, a subsequent fine that followed because of what that individual did. So certainly we do start to see that with the influences of the Renaissance, that um, that does take hold. Now, in terms of people drinking, alcohol was a part of the medieval diet. And so most alcohol did not have the same percentages that we do today. And so we're talking about three and a half percent, maybe on beer, it was not very strong. And so it, it was an important part of the medieval diet. And so men, women, children, all drank beer throughout the entire day and would consume liters within a single day. So in terms of drinking, that was not, not something unique. If I can kind of build off of that question a little bit, um, and maybe it's kind of connected with Patrick's question as well. If, I don't want to dismiss the, as, as you say, the cases as whimsy, um, even though these these prove these seem to be exceptional, but I'm kind of having a hard time establishing exactly what the local government or the state has a problem with if they are more irritated with the presence of these pubs and the function they serve in the city, or if they're really more irritated with the people that happen to frequent them. Is the, is that where the problem lies? Is it is it with the college students? Is, is that <laughs> is that I don't I don't want to do do an anachronism. Sure, I'm sure. Clearly unfamiliar with medieval history, um, but is it more the problem with that that community than with the public house itself? Yeah. So the city does not have a problem with the in, the establishments because the city, in fact, itself had owned several public houses. Um, the most famous was one right in the center of the square. Um, and this was next to the dungeon, the city dungeon. And so the city would lease that public house to different publicans and allow them to run it in, in exchange for some kind of cut of the profits. And so the city would own different public houses throughout the city. So it's not the establishments themselves, it's the people and what they do. In most cases, people would go to the public houses and buy alcohol, buy food, get lodging. They would use them for their intended purposes. Where the problem lies is when things get out of hand, when you start to get these nefarious activities, things that break certain laws or break certain norms or will cause others harm. And so that's when the, the city feels that it needs to step in. Because otherwise there isn't a, a lot of regulation on the public houses. Uh, most of the regulation on public houses is about the production of beer and the selling. It's more of the economics of the institution as opposed to the actions of the, the, the customers. Um, it's only once they get out of line, that's where the problem is. We have a, uh, a question in the chat uh, from Elena Elliott. Uh, with the research that you have done, do you plan to explore how the violence among the taverns has had a social impact in future historical events? Perhaps all the way up to the present day, maybe even. <laughs> continuity here. Um, certainly things have not changed, right? We can look at public houses in our society and see the same type of issues happening. To do some kind of long durée history would be quite difficult. And there are 
um, in terms of studies on these establishments, most studies are at later periods. So really I'm at the beginning of the studies on these establishments. Most of the studies are looking at the 16th, 17th, 18th and onwards centuries. A lot of that has to do with materials, with the sources available. Um, in most cases, there isn't a ton of sources to work with. I was fortunate because although most of my sources don't directly speak about these places, the actions and what the people are doing talk about these places. And so it's kind of like a back door by, to look at these places. So I was fortunate enough and am fortunate enough to have sources to speak on an earlier time period. If I wanted to move it forwards in time, then it would be easier, right? There are more sources, there are printed sources. Uh, most of mine are handwritten in this just illegible script they, that is impossible to read for the first three months you're working with it. Um, and so it would be much easier to do studies later in a later time period. Great, thank you. Uh, I, we have another question here in the chat, perhaps from someone who knows you, Professor Dovick. <laughs> okay. uh, the question is uh, from another Dovick, maybe unrelated, we'll see. I think, I think that's my brother. <laughs> oh, okay, it's your brother. <laughs> but great question. In medieval Poland, what was the law based on? Roman, civil, even though this is pre-Napoleon, common law, religious doctrine? So it's actually a combination of different laws. Uh, we see that Poland is on what some would call a borderland. It's, it's, it's between West and East. And so it's quite influenced by uh, the Germanic people, the Germans and the Eastern Orthodox and their influences and the Russians and things like that. So that leads to their legal system being this amalgamation of things. Um, it's heavily based on German law. And that's what you most commonly see, but they borrow from that and then they adapt and add Roman law to it. And they also create their own system, right? They're, the city in particular, I, I can't speak for the, for the rest of the, the kingdom, but the city in particular has its own jurisdiction. And so it ends up creating quite a lot of its own original laws based on that Germanic and Roman law. And so it's quite, quite interesting when you see what's legal, what's not legal. And then when you compare it to these old legal systems, uh, for example, most prevalently what, what I see the boundaries being blurred is the involvement of women in legal proceeding, proceedings. In Germanic law um, or German law, they were not allowed to be at court. They were supposed to be represented by some kind of male figure. But in my court cases, my records, they are there and present and defending themselves in, these, in court. And so you can see very clearly where they're picking and choosing what to follow, what not to follow, what to add to it and how to change it for themselves. Great, I have one question. Um, again, I have to go myself in about 12 minutes here to uh, get fully vaccinated. And I pr promise I won't, I won't stop by the uh, a tavern after, after that. But anyways, just let me say, let me ask, I, I have, I'm, in, I'm interested about the sources. Uh, you kind of mentioned that you were kind of reading a lot of, I guess, notorial notations for last, lack, I guess, uh, lack of a better um, uh, um, uh, expression. Uh, do, you, do you, however, do you see actually, have, are you able to read or are you able to find actually full proceedings as well where you're getting testimony? Um, uh, where maybe even kind of conflicting testimony between or among different participants in some of these uh, kind of more, I guess, conflicted, uh, conflicted engagements at, at the taverns? Yeah. Um, yes. But those are exceptional. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of like the majority of my court cases, I'm looking at three different collections. One is just the city, like citywide law, one is the royal law, and then one is the most violent crimes. And in most cases, in all three of those collections, they are just the briefest of notations. It's just a clerk that's present at the court proceedings, and he's just trying to put down who the accuser is, who, who's the defendant, what's the, the accusation, what's the punishment, and if there's a resolution, sometimes they will go back and write in the resolution. And so they're very bare minimum. And so 
those cases I had to use basically just for statistical analysis, just to you know crunch some data on them. But on occasion, you will get these just amazing page long court cases where you will have the defendants show up, you will have the accusers show up and they will give their side of the stories. Um, there will be disagreement. And then, you know, depending on who's in charge, if it's the, the mayor of the city or if it's the, the rector of the university, they then have to make a decision. In some instances, they will have follow-up court cases because no decision can be made or they will call more witnesses. Um, and so those are the ones that you can get the most anecdotal data, data from. Um, and so those are some of the exceptions that I showed today is where you have this, this more, um, more thorough court proceeding. Okay, no, that that's that clear that's uh, clarifies things for him because I thought for a, an instance there that nearly all of it's coming from just kind of notorial notations, and I guess one of the things I've experienced kind of working with these sorts of sources is, is oftentimes the notorial notations will say something about a case, but obviously it, the proceedings reveal much more about what the case is involving, right? Now, yeah. Kind of produced it. Yeah, there's there's been certain cases that I've tracked like throughout different years. Yeah. Um, Cause the books are all organized by a year. Um, as you get later in time, there's so many court cases that the books are actually so big that they're divided in half. Um, but you can trace them like through different years. And so I've had some court cases that have lasted five, six, seven years. Yeah. And in most cases, it's just that brief blurb, like, right. Oh, this person didn't show up today or it's, you know, they both showed up, they couldn't agree. So we'll, we'll delay this for another month or so. And so you see them popping up throughout these books, sometimes, you know, on different years, to, you know, in the, into the future. So it's interesting. Fascinating. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Other questions? All right, I think, uh... I'll take everyone's silence <laughs> as no. That Zoom silence is always a little bit more creepy than the actual silence in a room altogether. But uh, I'll take play music or something, you know? Yeah, <laughs> in, in a, an outro. <laughs> right. But uh, I'll take that as no. And uh, I, again, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Professor Dobek, for what is an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, and uh, just for the rich research that you were able to, to, to present here today. So thank yeah. you so much. This was- Thanks, the, thanks for having me. Thanks for allowing me to present my work. It's always exciting to do that. No, again, fantastic finish to, the, to our winter semester speaker series and a fantastic finish to the semester. Um, makes me want to go to a tavern. <laughs> Soon. Soon, right, yeah, not right now. Yeah, right, yeah, I'll wait. Yeah. But uh, thanks again, Professor Dobik, and thank you all for, for joining us this afternoon. Good luck with the rest of the semester, and uh, stay safe, everyone. <laughs>